I'm not really a native of California. Actually, I was born in Upper New York. My brother and I both had pneumonia, and the doctors told my mother, get your kids to California or they might die. And we both became runners. We moved to Long Beach, and there our house burnt down. My dad grabbed my brother and I and ran out the front door. My mother looking around for me and uh, said, well, where's Louie? And he said, well, right there. She said, you brought out a pillow. So he ran back in the house, searched around in the smoke. He found me under the bed. By the time he got me out the front door, the porch collapsed and he badly burnt his legs. Also, while in Long Beach at the age of four, I was challenged to a race down to the corner across the intersection. I was beaten badly, but the kid that beat me was hit by a car and mangled. <laughs> so from there, we moved to Torrance. <laughs> Torrance was surrounded by thousands of oil wells, and that was our after school and weekend uh, activity was climbing these wells. Uh, the, the derricks were made out of wood, of course, and some of the rungs on the ladders were split and cracked, and uh, I was climbing and uh, pulled a, a rung away. I fell backwards on top of a tin shed, bounced off into a sump hole, and of course you can't swim in oil. I'm sinking. I thought this is it. And I straddled about a four-inch pipe, and I held my breath and gradually worked myself up to the, to the side and pulled myself out, not just, just uh, south of town here. And I'm walking down Gramercy Street now, pitch black. <laughs> and as I walk down the middle of Gramercy, mothers were coming out on the porches looking at this uh, monstrosity or whatever you want to call it. And my mother was out on the porch. No one knew who it was. I stopped in front of my house and I just stood there looking at my mother. And she said, Louie? And I said, yeah. About that time my dad came home and um, all he had was a gallon of turpentine. And uh, so he cleaned me up good with the turpentine. The turpentine itself was bad enough, but then he put me in a tub of hot water and I turned red like a turnip. So that was my introduction to California. <laughs> then I started school in Torrance and uh, began to get in trouble. And uh, finally got to high school, gave the principal a lot of flack. As I was talking earlier in those days, they were allowed to belch you with a big wide leather strap. And uh, I felt that uh, pretty, pretty severely one day. And I got home and my mother and my dad said, what happened to you? You're black and blue all over. I said, the principal spanked me with a leather strap. He said, what did you do? When I told my dad what, what I did, he bent me over his knee and spanked me again. <laughs> I never did it. I never did it again. I was cured of that. The principal of the school had a particular interest in me because I was in trouble almost constantly. So he called my older brother and he said, you know, if we can get your brother out for athletics, that might keep him too busy to get in trouble. So they put me in the inner class track meet. I went out on the field and came in last. And uh, I swore I'd never get on the track again. I suffered too much, the pains of exhaustion. I made the mistake of starting my smoking at five years of age. And uh, I decided this wasn't for me. A week later, dual meet with Narbonne, they got me out on the track again. I said, well, this'll, this'll be it. My last race, I'll never, never touch the track again. And uh, as I came down the stretch and passed uh, a, a member of the Narbonne track team, I could hear the students from this school uh, cheering me on, you know, and this, uh, this was unbelievable. I had no idea that anyone even knew my name and they were hollering, come on, Louie. Well, that did it. I made my mind up that night to stop all this dissipation and become a runner. And so this was the first great problem in my life that I had to overcome, and that was a transition from a, uh, an errant, uh, undisciplined and dissipated teenager to a highly self-disciplined athlete. And once into running, I began to set my goals. I wanted to break the world's high school mile record. I wanted to make the, I wanted to break the national collegiate mile record for a very emotional reason. And then I wanted to make the 1940 Tokyo Olympics. Now you notice I skipped the 36th Olympics because I felt I was too young and inexperienced 
uh, to make the team. There were five great milers in the nation, all college graduates, and you have to be in the first three. Then I had an opportunity to run against the second best 5,000 meter runner in the nation. Now I didn't run against him to make the Olympics, that was out of the question. I just ran against him to see how close I could get to someone who would make the Olympics. And uh, coming down the home stretch, I passed him. And I was heading for the tape and I ran into a fellow from San Pedro that we were lapping and I fell and got up and my opponent now had gotten ahead of me, I had to catch him again, and uh, when we hit the tape, he beat me about an inch. But on the strength of that performance, uh, I was invited to the Olympic trials at Randall's Island, New York. Uh, the, the city of Torrance, the businessmen, gave me a suitcase, they gave me shaving gear, cologne, clothing, I mean, the, this city was behind me 100%, and I had my my dad worked for the Southern Pacific Railway, so I had a free ticket once a year anywhere in America. So I took advantage of that, got a train to New York. It took about four or five days. Got in the 5,000 meters against the world's record holder in the two miles, so I, I had a really a lack of self-esteem. I knew I couldn't beat him. I just had to get within the first three places to make the team. But the last lap, there was just he and I in front. I looked behind, there was a fellow about 40 yards behind. And I attempted to pass this fellow in the last 220, and he was too smart, he kept me on the outside, so I had to run the outside lane. For the last 220 we came in, and it was called a dead heat. Uh, so now I'm on the team, and this was a great thrill to me. When you make the Olympic team, it doesn't make any difference if you get last place in the Olympics, you're a winner, you're on the team. And what a thrill it was to go to Germany. And things have changed. Today, they don't even, they have the slightest conception of what I'm talking about. The Olympics wasn't just running and getting in a race and representing your country with meeting foreign athletes. Remember now, we travel by boat and by train. Today, these athletes, they see each other every weekend. And so that's not a big thrill anymore, but it was exciting to us to meet athletes from foreign countries and we would exchange hats and things like that and get, it, get their addresses and write and keep in touch for years to come. Following the Olympics, I came back to uh, enter USC in the fall and uh, there to run the mile, half mile, two mile, and relay, whatever they put me in. Got my NCAA record. And uh, then uh, the 1940 Tokyo Olympics were upon us and I was training hard for that. and. Uh, then the news came out that the Olympics were canceled, and so went to war instead. I went into the Army Air Corps the day I left for overseas, uh, the famous Charlie Paddock, the character in uh, Chariots of Fire that was supposed to be beaten from America. Charlie Paddock gave me a Trojan ring for good luck. I ended up in Hawaii, that was our base, had a number of missions, bombing Wake Island, midnight, uh, Christmas Eve, 1942, and uh, with Bombay tank, the longest raid in the history of the war, 4,500 miles with, with one load of gas, and that was unbelievable. Uh, we, we actually did a dive bombing act over the island. Now this is a heavy bomber, and to use a heavy bomber for dive bombing is something unique. We, pulled, we flew over at 10,000 feet, pulled out at 3,500 feet, and uh, flattened the island, but we had used our wing tank gas first, and the Bombay tanks were still full, so when we pulled up from the dive, the straps that held the tanks on stretched and uh, too, too, too far so that the Bombay doors would not close. Confinement. They allowed one native on the island, now this island is, is, is occupied by the Japanese, but there were some natives there. And he, he insisted on talking to me. And they allowed us to have 20 minutes together. And this guy was a fanatic Trojan follower. He knew every record I broke. He knew every guy on the football team, every, every score of every game. And then he left and he said, well, unfortunately, Louis says they execute all prisoners taken on this island. And sure enough, I found nine names engraved on the wall of my cell. It said nine Marines were ruined on Macon Island, August 12, 1942. They were part of a famous commando raid under 
uh, James Roosevelt on the island of Macon, and uh, they actually went ashore at midnight in a surprise attack against the Japanese. But evidently, they uh, got fouled up on their timing or direction, didn't show up at the a departure point on the beach, and thus back to the safety of the submarine. They were left there stranded, uh, placed in this in this, these very cells that we were in, but unfortunately all nine were killed by decapitation. So we had that to look forward to every morning when we woke up. Uh, but finally, on the 43rd day, an officer came in and said, tomorrow you will go to Yokohama as prisoners of war finally over. I return home to, to, to face the, the only problem uh, in my life I could never cope with, and that was uh, the post-war adjustment. Uh, I tried out for the 1948 Olympics. I had two years now, and I got in fairly good shape, but when I started pushing myself into world-class competition shape, I had a muscle explosion in my canoe. And I began to feel sorry for myself and began to drink a lot with a couple of my old SC, I mean my Olympic buddies, the three of us used to meet every night. My wife got disgusted, decided not to go with us, and she stayed out of that part of my life. And uh, it just got to the point where she... <laughs> pick uh, among teenagers. Uh... Yes. <laughs> well, I had... Uh, run the 5,000 meters. I gained 14 pounds, by the way, on the boat going over. I'd never seen so much food in my life. And I ate my way across the Atlantic, and I couldn't lose the 14 pounds. So I wasn't really in shape for the final race, but I always had a good kick. So the, the, the pace was too fast for me, so there's a bunch, seven guys up here, and there's about another uh, seven or eight of us, the second bunch 50 yards behind, another bunch behind us about 50 yards. And the last lap, I took off from this pack and I caught the first pack, so I finished with the leaders. And in doing so, unbelie uh, it was unbelievable to me, I ran that last quarter in 56 seconds. And I don't think I even ran a quarter of a mile that fast, but anyway, uh, after, the, uh, after I took my shower, I came back in the grandstand. The Americans were here, there's a buffer zone of officers here, Goring and Daring and all those, and then there's the box where Hitler was. Well, we had our cameras. Anybody that wanted a picture taken of Hitler had to give it to one of the officers. Then he would want to know your name. Uh, Hitler had a great memory. He was there every day at the games. And the story about Jesse Owens is not a true story. I think if you watch the 84 Jesse Owens story, they brought out the truth uh, that uh, Hitler had, uh, had shunned Jesse Owens. It wasn't Jesse Owens. It was, uh, it was uh, Cornelius Johnson from Compton. He was the first gold medalist and Hitler just couldn't believe that the Aryan race hadn't won that, that, the high jump. So he was the one that was shunned. So anyway, we took our, gave our cameras to, uh, I gave mine to, uh, no, see, the skinny guy, what's his name, Goring. And he said, what's your name? I said, why? He says, Hitler wants to know the name of every athlete that, that take, has his picture taken. I said, well, he wouldn't, he wouldn't know me, I didn't win anything. Uh, but 